Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Mobius, and I am the president of the Civil War Roundtable Congress. And welcome to our speaker series. I am coming to you from the city of Seattle, high atop the shipwreck parking garage. I'm up here because the Mariners are having their home opener on Jackie Robinson Day. So I am asking that everyone uh, turn off their uh, their microphones. And the way that you do that on your Zoom screen, in the lower left corner, just click or touch that uh, uh, that microphone one time. And I'm also going to ask that you mute your uh, your video. There, right next to the uh, the microphone icon is a camera icon, and if you will click that. That will help us. We're going to be using the chat feature. Chat is uh, just to the right of the middle button. And uh, we would love for you to use chat for your comments and your questions. Our speakers are not compensated. So we are in, uh, asking you to invite Brian and Chris to your Civil War Roundtable. And you can see Brian's email address and Chris's email address, send them a, um, an invitation, and I'm sure that they will show up. Please like and follow us on our face, uh, Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And thank you so very much to all of our donors. We have a number of special events coming up. Um, Many of them are on Friday. A few of them are on Wednesday. So uh, take a look at our, um, our website, cwrtcongress.org slash special.html. Tonight, uh, Chris Mikowski, Brian Matthew Jordan are here to talk about the great what ifs of the Civil War. And um, so I'm going to ask the very first question. How did you guys get together and how did you decide to to write about the great what if? I'll, I'll show that I'm actually wearing my um, Jackie Robinson number 12 in Dodger blue today for Jackie Robinson Day. Uh, a fantastic milestone, actually. Um, so glad to commemorate that. Thanks for having us today, uh, Mike. Um, really, the what if book was my um secret plot to have an opportunity to work with brian who is um a, a historian whose work i admire and i'm vocal about it every opportunity i have the chance to to talk about it um he's an exceptional writer an exceptional historian and i thought i'm going to come up with some sneaky way to coerce him unknowingly into working on a project with me and that has turned into a two volume what if set and it's really just been a delight to uh, to be able to work with him uh and i'm only saying that half jokingly i'm i'm honestly i swear to god um i've just got a huge man crush on brian and really respect his work so. Brian's like, I can't say anything after that. <laughs> on a more serious note, and, and, and I think that the Brian can parlay off this a little bit. Um, talking about what ifs is one of those things that uh, all of us do, um, you know, whether we're explicit about it, hanging out with our buddies, walking on a battlefield, talking about, well, what if this had happened? What if that happened? Or we're having a few drinks, uh, having some beers, talking Civil War stuff, or we might ask a question at a round table. Um, and uh, it's it's usually done because we're we're trying to understand what actually happened a little bit better, and by kind of probing these counterfactuals, it helps us uh, to kind of use our creative thinking and our, our critical thinking to explore what actually happened. And uh, it's something we generally do for fun. Um, and so we wanted to do you know a, a what if collection because it's something that uh, we thought would have wide appeal because so many people like to engage in wondering what if. No, I'll add on to that, and thanks for your your comments, Chris. And likewise, it was a, a pleasure to to work with you. Um, and I think the the man crush goes both ways. Uh, counterfactual questions, right, are are posed almost perennially, uh, and by popular audiences. 
uh, Chris and I both spend a lot of time on the cannonball circuit, and I don't, I can't uh, recall the last time I, you know, either of us gave a public talk where a counterfactual question was not um, asked of us by a member of the audience. Um, it uh, counterfactual thinking, I think, uh, excites people about the past, but. Professional historians, right, especially those in the academy, they tend to bristle at these sorts of, of questions um, because they can't be empirically answered, right? Historians are trained to find, interpret, and evaluate documentary evidence, and we're, we're trained in a very specific way how to build our arguments, how to make claims. Historians, no surprise, are terrible prognosticators. We're even worse sci-fi writers. Right, so uh, a lot of us in the counterfactual questions at arm's length. But I think, and, and one of the, the really great things I think came out of this collection uh, and out of the, the second volume that will be forthcoming, I think is an argument that, that emerged organically and that is the extent to which counterfactual thinking can be a really serious and useful historical tool. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the historian Niall Ferguson, and I'm gonna paraphrase him here. He, he said, you know, to understand history as it actually was, you need to understand how it actually wasn't um, and to understand how to contemporaries it might've been. What counterfactual thinking does, what a lot of these essays do is to open up the range of possibilities that ordinary Civil War Americans faced. They didn't understand how it was going to turn out. They didn't understand um, what we today know from, from hindsight. We have to put ourselves back into the shoes of historical actors, back into the context of the war itself. And when you think about uh, lost alternatives, alternative endings, um, possibilities that we, we haven't explored, you kind of get back to the, the fluidity and the tentativeness and the uncertainty that our narratives too often, I think, efface. And, and I think that, you know, we approach this, you know, my approach generally is, you know, as a beer and cigars kind of conversation, but the army does staff rides in that very same idea that um, in the moment, any one person had an array of possibilities around them and they made a particular decision that we through hindsight know how it worked out. But in that moment, as, as Brian says, um, they didn't know how that was going to work out. And so they have all these choices. And so by asking what if it allows us to look at those choices and consider what might have happened based on the actual information um, that we through hindsight are able to enjoy that folks in the moment weren't able to. Um, and I think that that's what gives us an advantage asking what if, but it's a really important opportunity to, to remind ourselves that none of this was inevitable in the moment. And so we can better understand that moment by trying to explore it a little bit. I want to make a quick correction. My blue number is 42, not 12, uh, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, so, and, and, and one of the, the premises that Brian and I really tried to stick to is like, we wanted people to, um, we wanted our historians, our colleagues to treat people uh, in the way that they were in the moment. Um, we can't suddenly have a suddenly bold George McClellan. Um, we can't have, um, you know, people acting out of character for themselves. Uh, and we also couldn't have what's known as the magic bullet, you know, like suddenly Abraham Lincoln gets shot two years earlier and that changes the course of the, you know, we wanted to really stick with the facts as, as they existed at the time and really try to, um, you know, really flesh that out and explore and look at and people as they were in the circumstances they found themselves and talk about what could or could not have happened as a result. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think, um, you know, insofar as they conjure up implausible scenarios or whisk us off to never, never land or will away the harsh, uncomfortable truths of the past, counterfactuals aren't very useful. But when they're kind of tethered to context, when they're tethered to the actual conditions on the ground, um, there are attempts at history and, and not just exercises in, in fantasy. And I think 
the essays that we have assembled in this book from some up and coming and kind of mid-career historians do exactly that. They show us a war that's alive with contingency and lost alternative and, and possibility and, and help us to probe the war some, from some oblique angles. I think one reason why it, the idea of asking what if um, is something that a lot of you know, professional historians disparage, um, and, you know, as Brian said, you can't objectively measure that. Um, but also, you know, a lot of people veer into that idea of wishful thinking, like they ask what if, because really what they're interested in is talking about the answer they want to have. Uh, and probably the best example that, that we could talk about would be, you know, if Stonewall Jackson hadn't got shot at, at Chancellorsville, well, gosh, he shows up in Gettysburg and conquers uh, Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill and the entire Union Army and sweeps into Washington and captures Moscow in the winter and, you know, just does the whole thing. And like, because people want that ending. Well, unfortunately, if Jackson hadn't gotten shot, you don't get that ending anyway. <laughs> and so, you know, one of the things we really try to do is, is explore those assumptions that people make when they ask what if uh, so that if they're doing some wishful thinking well we need to maybe ground you in in what was possible and plausible not just get you to the fantasy answer that you're hoping for and i, I think one of the most exciting pieces in the book is actually chris white's essay on this very question what happens if stonewall jackson makes it to gettysburg and one of the things that Chris brilliantly points out in that essay is that folks who love to go down that rabbit hole end the narrative on the evening of July the 1st, uh, you know, in order to make the case that, um, you know, the war ends completely differently without thinking about the possibility, right, that the Army of the Potomac will fall back to the Pipe Creek line, that Gettysburg would be a minor skirmish, maybe the penultimate battle in the campaign. And so he plays with, um, that scenario and those um, that sequence of events in his essay so brilliantly, but also exactly as Chris was saying, gets to this other question, which is why do we ask what if questions and and what role have they served over time? And and often that gets us into the the terrain of historical memory and and yes, the the way that we have always preferred to um, think about the Civil War as a nation. It was a long answer for you, Mike. I hope it was sufficient. <laughs> Let me uh, ask Brian a question real quick. I, I, you know, I, when, when the three of us were talking about this, I said it'd be kind of cool for us to sort of bat some ideas around together. And, and Brian, let me ask you, like, of the essays that are in the book, um, what's something that maybe uh, set off a light bulb for you as you were reading and editing and you were like, oh, yeah, that's kind of... Yeah, I think, um, I mean, Chris White's essay, as I, as I um, just mentioned, I think is, is really the, the most intellectually exciting for me in, in this book. Um, I think um, you know, there are so many pieces here that, um, that we can think about. Um, Kristen Pollack's piece um, on um, the, uh, Sterling Price's 1864 uh, expedition into Missouri, um, a campaign that's completely understudied, uh, that scarcely anyone writes about, you know, and she thinks about, you know, what, what happens if this army of Missouri takes uh, a slaveholding border state in 1864, right in a presidential election year, um, and you know, suddenly that campaign becomes something more than a quixotic raid. Um, punctuated by, by three battles, right? It becomes a, a lost alternative that, that we thought a lot about. So uh, there are so many um, takeaways like that in this book. Tim Smith's uh, piece, the, the lead essay on Shiloh, uh, again, really shows how counterfactual questions intersect with ideas about historical memory, right? We want to um, kind of think about the death of Albert Sidney Johnston as a, uh, a, a hinge moment in the battle. Uh, but one of the reasons that we do that, right, is because we, we want to do so at the expense of PGT Beauregard. And that comes right out of the lost cause. It comes out of the memorialization that happens on the battlefield. It comes out of the essay on Shiloh that Albert Sidney Johnston's son will pen for the Battles and Leaders series back in the 1880s. So thinking about counterfactual questions 
not only intellectually interesting for helping us to think about the war's military history, but counterfactual questions themselves also have a, a history, a very long history that goes back to the war itself. One of my favorite things about Tim Smith's essay, uh, and not to spoil things, but, you know, he talks about all these different what ifs and what if, you know, what if Johnson hadn't been uh, killed and what if Bargard had launched his evening attack and what if uh, Lou Wallace hadn't got lost. And at the, <laughs> his final assessment is none of that mattered. Things would have turned out the same. <laughs> and uh, particularly to hear that from Tim Smith, who, you know, knows the, that Shiloh battlefield and the memory of the battlefield and the historiography of the battlefield. And, you know, uh, to have him basically come to that assessment. Uh, and as I recall, um, when we, he was one of the first people we asked for the collection and he's like, yeah, yeah. And, you know, we gave him like, you know, three or four months and he turned it around in like two weeks. He'd obviously been thinking about it. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I just like uh, popped this out since I was thinking about it. I think he was the first to ask in the, yeah, in the first, uh, first essay. He's amazingly prolific anyway. So, you know, we shouldn't be surprised. I know. <laughs> so. So what questions do folks have for us? I'm seeing some things in the chat here. Let me uh, scroll back up here. Yeah, I, I've opened it up. Yeah. Let, me, um, let me see here. Uh, there is hello from Carlisle, England. And uh, what if the Confederates had not bombed Fort Sumter? This is going to be like stump the historian for us tonight, isn't it? <laughs> Dwight Hughes actually had uh, pondered this question, and he's convinced that if it hadn't happened in Fort Sumter, then Pensacola, Florida, was probably the more the, the most likely next place. Um, if it didn't happen at Sumter, it was going to happen someplace. And uh, Dwight's vote was for Pensacola. Yeah, I would. Um, you know, I'm working right now on a big. Uh, general history of, of the war, and um, I'm working on the early chapters right now, and one of the things that I'm emphasizing is that, you know, Fort Sumter obviously is the, the moment, right, um, at the beginning of the war that, that rallies um, so many folks in the North and leads to Lincoln's call for troops, but that actually comes at the end of a very, very long secession winter of Confederates uh, or soon to be Confederates seizing federal garrisons and property all across the South in Baton Rouge and Pensacola and other places, other military installations. So yeah, if, if not Fort Sumter, then, then somewhere else. Um, but that, that somewhere else was, was happening quite a lot. And, and Fort Sumter is, is, is kind of the, uh, the straw that breaks the camel's back, if you will. No, uh, uh, it might be better if uh, if you would, uh, Chris or, or Brian, if you would read the question. There, I have a very small screen, and I'm not so sure about the audio. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I'll, I'll be glad to. Um, I actually wanted to kind of circle back to something Brian had said a second ago when he talked about the long tradition of what ifs as uh, having its own historiography. And one of the things that we try to do with our essay, with some of our suggested readings, um, is really provide some of that theoretical context. Uh, and, you know, I do, again, sound a little cavalier when I talk about beer and cigars, um, but there is a, an actual long intellectual tradition that goes with what ifs. And I think most of us are kind of familiar with um, one of two ways of looking at it. alternate histories, which is basically the fictions. And then one would be the counterfactual history, which is, you know, more of the, um, you know, trying to use the tools of a historian to, to answer a question. And, and again, I think that that's, you know, one thing that upsets professional historians is that uh, people aren't always good at making the distinction between those two intellectual traditions, because once you start asking what if, and you've got Robert E. Lee with AK-47s, and I'll, you know, get in, you know, down the road of alternative histories that way, um, you know, of course, that's nonsense, you know, and of course, it's easy to dismiss that. But, you know, as uh, William Fortune and Newt Gingrich talk about in their Gettysburg trilogy, uh, what, what they call active history, um, you know, what might have happened at the, at the moment as Lee and Longstreet are deciding, should they go around to the right? Um, and what's plausible in that moment, and and again, kind of unpacking that from 
from a, a factual point of view or counterfactual point of view, uh, that's a lot different than the AK-47s. Uh, and so we're really trying, you know, we, we talk a little bit about both of those traditions and both have their merits. And a lot of us like to read alternate histories because they're just flat out fun. Um, but also a lot of us like to read counterfactuals because they help us get those gears grinding. And it's important to just understand why we're reading each and what advantages and disadvantages each of those traditions has for us. And I would add on to that as much as academic historians sort of poo poo counterfactual history, they are, they engage in a lot of it um, <laughs> in their own work. I'm thinking of, you know, very well respected um, seminal works in American historiography. I'm thinking of C. Van Woodward's Strange Career of Jim Crow, uh, which the entire premise of that book, right, is reconstruction as a lost alternative, that there's no straight line from slavery to segregation. And it's about recovering the, the welter of possibilities at the end of the Civil War. I'm thinking about more recent Green's uh, recent book called about how Americans fought the Civil War. I mean, the major argument that emerges there is that if you situate the Civil War in the context of other 19th century military engagements, it looks a lot different. The war could have been a lot worse. It could have been a lot bloodier if other things had played out as they were contemporaneously around the globe. So as much as academic historians like to say that they don't kind of embrace the counterfactual as a tool that produces historical knowledge, the truth is that they, they really quite often do. And, that, and that's often kind of where I, I think about the beer and cigars where, you know, at the end of a conference and everyone's going over to the bar for a drink to relax and talk about stuff. And those, those sorts of conversations come up and those questions come up. Uh, speaking of questions, so we've got some of the question bar. I'm going to skip specific what if questions for now, although maybe we can circle back to some of those, but I want to kind of keep the, the discussion broad for us for a moment. Um, at least. And, and uh, Brian, here's a, a follow-up question from Gerald Payne uh, about the early actions of the, you know, that led up to Sumter. Uh, were the, was the Confederates taking over U.S. forts, arsenals, etc. before the Civil War? Were that really acts of war? Well, the, um, a, a very good question, and a question that Civil War Americans themselves were asking in, in real time. You know, there was a real conversation about uh, what exactly this was. Was this an insurrection? Was it a rebellion? Um, was it a war? I mean, that's something that, that folks are going to, to wrestle with throughout the, the, the conflict. Um, Dwight Hughes actually in our volume touches upon some of this when he gets into the prize cases and the, the laws of war and the question of, of British neutrality, such as it was. Um, uh, certainly from, from my perspective, right, this would be uh, an, an act of war. This is a Demo 1860s, a democratically held presidential election. Um, so some Southern states don't like the results of that election. And so they decide to seize federal military installations to haul down the stars and stripes and to put up different flags. That to me is um, an, an act of war, an act of, of insurrection and provided pretext for um, the United States Army to um, begin mustering volunteers and enlisting soldiers. So, um, and you mentioned Dwight, and he's got an essay in there about, um, you know, the naval interactions and how that may or may not have triggered European um, recognition and intervention. Cheryl Rice asks, um, what if the Confederacy had been recognized by one or some of the European countries? And Dwight really gets into that in his essay and talks about sort of the factors that um, were, that might have tipped things in that direction. But there are a lot of pros and cons that a lot of people didn't realize. And Dwight spends a lot of time really kind of getting into that. So uh, not to give away the store, uh, but Cheryl, I'll point you to Dwight's essay there to, to fully explore that. Um, there's a, a, an interesting novel, um, Robert Conroy. Uh, it's 1862 is the name of it. And it's basically, um, you know, what if uh, the Slidell affair triggers the uh, European intervention? And that's kind of a fun historical fiction exploration of that question. Uh, let's see. Um, thoughts on Gingrich? and Fortune as, and Ralph Peters as historical novelists. Uh, you want to take a stab at that at first, Brian? 
I will confess that I have not read um, any of uh, the Gingrich and Forston or uh, Ralph Peters uh, books. So I will leave that to my friend okay. and who is an English professor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually just read my first Ralph Peters novel uh, last year. Uh, he, he released one about Chancellorsville. I thought it was really well written, uh, well paced, um, believable. Um, you know, it wasn't as cerebral as like Killer Angels, which I still think stands out as the finest historical novel I've read. Uh, but it was certainly a, a good snappy read. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, as far as the Gingrich Fortune novels, um, what I thought they did effectively there, um, particularly as they get farther away from Gettysburg, it's harder to extrapolate what really would have happened. Um, they do take the army down to Pipe Creek and, you know, as the trilogy continues on. But one thing that I think that they are effective at doing is they start borrowing from what actually happened in the war and putting those events uh, in, uh, in their novels. So, for instance, they're fighting the Battle of Frederick, Maryland, and James McPherson is involved, and he finds himself running against some confederates that had broken through and he waves his hat and turns around to run and and uh, get shot down on the streets of frederick in a very similar fashion to the way he was shot down right outside of atlanta um, and he, so they borrow a lot of actual events and kind of repurpose them for their novels so at least they weren't going completely out on the limb and having ak fate ak 47 show up and that kind of stuff oh, I have flowers not you said so. have flowers um, so I'm just going to remind folks if they could keep their microphones uh, <laughs> muted if you're not talking, um, just so that we can kind of stay focused on our conversation here. Um, I'm, I'm, again, skipping over some of the specific what ifs. Um, doo -doo -doo. My question for you, gentlemen, this comes from Cindy. Um, in your travels and research, do either of you encounter folks who, especially in the South, who refer to the war as the war between the states or other alternatives to civil war? I, I certainly have. I don't know about you, Chris. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and it's funny, it, it, you know, when I give tours, uh, you know, I, I can challenge people about that, not not necessarily in an aggressive sort of way, but I remember in the days when I'd be working for the park service, you're behind that desk and someone comes in and, you know, they start talking about the war of northern aggression. And, you know, it's harder when you're wearing a uniform to challenge an interpretation like that or or to get people to think about why they're calling you that versus versus something else. I, I think about that that question with my undergraduate and graduate students. There's an excellent recent article that was in the Journal of the Civil War Era by Gaines Foster called What's in a Name? And he kind of runs through the, the history of the naming of the Civil War and um, thinking about um, the popularity of, of different names at different times and and what what exactly is in a name so uh Gaines foster uh what's in a name from the journal of the civil war era within the last two or three years it's a really really provocative um thought-provoking piece and i think what's really important about that is you know when when you control the name of something you immediately set the context for the discussion about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I know that a lot of people, you know, it almost becomes like a political thing, like, oh, they're worried about calling it this or worried about calling that. Or that you know. But that's where every discussion starts is its name. And so once you um, control that name, you control the discussion. And so there's actually a tremendous amount of power and leverage that comes with the label you ascribe to something. So to me, it's not just an intellectual uh, exercise or someone having their feelings hurt or feeling bent out of shape or any of that. Um, it's square one for any discussion. And that makes it incredibly important. So. Uh, James Donahue asks, Many have questioned the situation of whether maintaining the Union versus slavery and states' rights were the true reasons for the South to begin to secede and begin the Civil War. I maintain that it was slavery and, of course, the need for Lincoln to preserve the nation. Again, the root cause was slavery. One must ponder the question, what if there was no slavery? Would there 
even have been a civil war? The answer to me is obvious, a resounding no. Um, and it might sound like one of those specific what if questions that I said I was going to skip for a moment. Um, but I think this is really provocative in the sense that, you know, we spend all our time talking about civil war stuff and maybe not enough people go back and think about those sorts of um, contextual questions about the war. Um, and, uh, you know, I would agree with James's perspective and that slavery is really the trigger. Um, it was James McPherson who once said, uh, there are many causes of the civil war and they're all slavery. Uh, and, you know, anytime someone can uh, think of, a, well, no, it was about this, or right, right, you can always kind of uh, peel those questions back and, and trace them back to slavery in some way. Brian, any thoughts on that? I mean, I would, I would absolutely agree uh, with everything that you've just said, Chris, and with James's uh, premise here. Without slavery, there, there is no uh, civil war. Um, and, you know, I mean, this also gets us into... Um, you know, a, a much older, more venerable historical scholarship at the turn of the 20th century, which wanted to, thinking about alternative endings and wanting to imagine things with the say, we're going to have a generation of American historical scholarship that suggested that slavery was dying out and that the war was hopelessly tragic because it would have gone away of its own volition, right? The soil was eroding, it was becoming increasingly less profitable. And of course, we've debunked all of that since, right? Slavery was never more profitable than it was in 1860. Uh, the soil was not eroding. Slaveholders had enough ingenuity and creativity to take and plant slavery wherever they wanted to plant it. Uh, white Southern slaveholders were not insular. They dreamed about and lusted after a global slaveholding empire. Um, that's a, a different way to get at this, this same point, right? That um, you know, without slavery, there, there isn't a civil war. Um, and yeah, I think getting back to basics and along with the naming question, right? Um, you know, that, that helps us to, to situate this, this event in its, in its context. And I think it's, you know, as soon as you mentioned the states' rights slavery question, you know, that gets into some of the same territory that people get into with their what ifs. And, and they're, it's really, they're kind of jumping to the wishful thinking and not basing things in fact. And, uh, you know, so people don't want to talk about those sorts of issues. They don't want to talk about that particular question because they've got their mind made up already. They know how they want the story to end or how they want that question to be answered. Um, and so it's always a challenge for us as historians to meet people where they're at, help them understand here's the factual context for what we're discussing, you know, whatever it might be, and try to um, work with their biases to still answer the question in a way that's true to the answer, um, not the answer somebody wants. Uh, to me, as a public historian, that's, you know, one of the most challenging things we have to do. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's one. And I said, I was going to skip this specific what ifs, but I got to, I got to throw this one out for us here, Brian, because talk about wishful thinking. What if Governor Warren had murdered Sheridan at five forks? And I'm like, I'm right with you, Joe. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> would he have gotten away with it as Sickles uh, and the uh, blue Jeff Davis did? Like, oh man, I hadn't thought of that, but wow, what a great idea. Um, no, not, not to advocate <laughs> murder, but like, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Warren wanted to. Um, had every reason to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great question. Great question. Uh, Raid asks um, By every measure of power, the North surpassed the South by orders of magnitude. I got a. Um, um, Size and size of population and military, size of industrial base, and size of the railway network. Why did it take so long for the North to defeat the South? Ooh, that's a good question. It's a very good question, and I think it is an index of exactly what we were talking about: the stubborn tenacity of um, and the extent to which folks would go to um, create a, a slaveholders' republic. Um, the, the depth of the conviction uh, that was, was held. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, it's truly remarkable to think about what this war cost in terms of, in just human capital alone, just speaking nothing of the, the physical and environmental resources. 
Um, you know, I, I tell my students all the time that they should compare the United States Constitution with the Confederate Constitution, right? There are a couple of key differences between these documents. Uh, the Confederate Constitution provides for a single six-year term for the president, gives him a line item veto, um, and also mentions the institution of slavery no fewer than 10 times, right? Um, why do 382,000 Confederate soldiers um, give their lives over the course of, of four years? Do they, they do that for a line item veto? No, they do that for uh, the institution of slavery and to create a, a, a white slaveholders republic, um, a nation where all men are not created equal. And the depth of that conviction um, I think is indexed by um, what you see on the battlefield. It finds tactical articulation, right? Civil War armies are incredibly literate armies. They are incredibly politically aware of what is at stake um, on both sides, right? Northern soldiers, um, um, many will become um, uh, more enlightened on this race, the war continues, but even who don't, right, have a very clear understanding of what union means and that the union is the last best hope of earth and that what's at stake is um, self-government and, and Republican, small r, Republican democracy, um, just as Confederate soldiers understand um, uh, what's at stake is, is their, um, their order of, of things, uh, their perfect liberty, which is the liberty to enslave other other human beings. Um, so um, the depth of conviction, I think, explains quite a lot about why the war um, continued on as, as long as it did. Chris, I don't know if you have thoughts that you want to add there. Certainly, we could talk a lot more about this. Yeah, and kind of to riff off what you just said and tie it back to an earlier comment, too, was that um... You know, I bet you there are plenty of soldiers who are not going into battle thinking, I'm going into this fight to preserve slavery. Uh, maybe it's like, I'm going to preserve my way of life. But what's that way of life based on, you know? And so even people who didn't own slaves benefited from the economy that was built on slavery. And so that way of life was still um, very explicitly tied into that, even if it wasn't a conscious forefront thought for one of these soldiers. And I think that's, um, you know, necessary for any discussion we have on slavery or states' rights. But that's the sort of approach we've been trying to take with the what ifs as well, is like, let's peel back what we think we know and really get into tracing this backward and looking at the factual context and, and going from there. Um, and uh, so I think that that's really important. Um, it's funny because uh, this sort of relates to, I think the most common question I've been asked since we announced the what if book. And a lot of people are like, well, yeah, I, I kind of want to know what if the, the South had won the war? You know, um, a lot of people have been wanting to jump to that question. And, and maybe they, they even haven't necessarily had an answer but that notion of the south winning or why did it take so long for the north to win and you know could the south have pulled it out people are really still fascinated by that you know 160 years later um and i don't know that there's necessarily a straight and clear answer but i think brian's is excellent in that just this notion of of will and trying to figure out from a military point of view how to translate public will into military success and there's a learning curve that both both sides have to kind of overcome and it's i think the north that overcomes that first so. you know chris something that you said there sparked the thought that this is this this question could the south have won or what would happen if the south had won the civil war it probably is the oldest yeah. counterfactual question you can go back to edmund ruffin Right, who tugs the first lanyard on uh, an artillery piece there at uh, at Fort Sumter? Um, the Virginia agricultural theorist, uh, the fire-eating secessionist, he writes um, a, a novel um, called Anticipations of the Future, which he publishes actually before the war, and it envisions Lincoln winning the election of eighteen sixty. Uh, serving out his term, but then being um, replaced in 1864 by William Henry Seward, the Secretary of State, um, um, perceived to be far more radical on the question of emancipation, and then 
he kind of envisions this scenario playing out into a, a fratricidal war that's that's very costly and um you know this is probably the oldest counterfactual question and 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 you're right the one that's um, most perennially asked I, I would say alongside the yes the the question that i wrote about in the the volume what, what if lincoln had lived yeah yeah. And, you know, I think probably the most famous answer to that question comes from McKinley Cantor, who wrote that the South had won the Civil War. And, um, you know, talk about the magic bullet theory, you know, Grant falls off a horse and, and dies. And so that's why the South wins. And by the end of the, the book, the United States, the Confederate States and the Great Republic of Texas are all talking about coming back to become a single country because of the space rate. And it's just like, wow, this goes off the rails from a counterfactual point of view into that realm of wishful thinking uh, pretty quickly. Uh, Robert Ransom has a great book that's really um, fact-based called Confederate States of America, uh, where he analyzes economics and politics and social questions and things. And it's a really good, I think, counterfactual exploration of that question. Uh, and I would add on to, in, on to that as well in the realm of popular culture. And you write about this, Chris, in the, the introduction to the book, but the mockumentary yeah. That appeared uh, what, probably about 2004, um, playing with this question: What if the South had won? Um, it is um, absolutely um, something that, that folks should should watch. I, one of the more affecting scenes in that uh, mockumentary is um, it envisions a a QVC like channel where um, human chattel, right, are, are of course sold on on television. Imagines. What would have what would the confederacy have looked like as an independent nation yeah my two favorite things about that mockumentary is they have their own sort of version of a shelby foot as a historian talking head in that which is you know a clear reference to shelby foot and they have like fake commercials in the mockumentary that kind of show you what life was like in the csa and there's an insurance commercial where they talk about this insurance company and they're going to protect your family and your property and they end with your property and a slave looks up and smiles at the camera and you know that whole notion of the happy slave carried on into the modern era um, and it's jarring to see um, I highly recommend that. That's a great, uh, great call on your part to pull that one out. So, uh, Kevin Obar asks, "What is your favorite what if?" Mm. Yeah, mine is is probably the one that I uh, wrote about in the the book. Not surprisingly, um, what if Lincoln had lived? because it's really a way to talk about Lincoln and race, Lincoln and his blueprints for reconstruction, and to talk about just how complex um, that whole process really was. There's no um, you know, user's guide to reconstruction. There's no user's manual for uh, fighting a, a, a civil war. And you know, the, the answer to that question is, as the essay shows in the in the book, it's it's complex, right? To think about Lincoln's evolution with respect to slavery and race, but also to to think about the figure of Andrew Johnson, who of course becomes the seventeenth president, is elevated to the executive mansion by Booth's bullet, and to think about here's someone who embraces union, right? Um, and even embraces emancipation, but that you can you can embrace union and emancipation and still at the same time be a virulent racist. That is consistent in 19th century America. Um, that that you know we we love as modern day observers to look back at the war and to put everybody in their neat boxes and into their neat categories, and and yet they're often not the categories of the boxes or the labels that. 19th century that would have made sense to 19th century actors and I think that that question in particular kind of gets you into that territory in some fun and exciting ways and you know uh, someone in the chat mentioned earlier um, you know how there's a tendency for modern audiences to uh, not properly empathize with the audiences of the past and we're inflicting sort of our own interpretation and, and values and perspective on these past questions and passing judgment uh and as you say like 
some of this, some of those things wouldn't even make sense to people in 1860 or 1865. Um, and so for us to try to then judge them based on things that would have had no meaning to them um, really makes our own judgments meaningless, um, at least from a, a perspective of, of trying to understand something. Um, so I, you know, I always try to be a little more empathetic about these people as we're looking back at them because, um, uh, you know, they're going through something that I, I didn't go through, you know, and my experience is entirely different. And so I can't judge them for their experience based on my own experience. Um, so, um, Cheryl Rice asks, uh, what if Grant had led the North from the beginning of the war? And I think this goes back to Brian's question or Brian's answer about why did it take so long for the Federals to win? And it also sort of violates the premise that Brian and I have been working on where, you know, like what was what was factually possible at the moment and for Grant to be leading the war from the moment uh, for, for, for Grant to be leading the war from the beginning of the war wasn't factually possible. So it would be sort of one of those questions that we would throw a yellow flag for and call a penalty on because <laughs> it's a little bit out of bound. Um, but um, uh, so, so I think that that sort of speaks to that framework that we've been talking about. I guess I, I'm thinking here, Brian, I didn't think I answered the question of my favorite uh, what if. Uh, and I just go back to the Stonewall Jackson one, which I've written about on the blog and written about in other places. So that's why I asked Chris to write it because I'm a Jackson fanboy and Chris is not. And I thought he would have a much more interesting perspective as a non fanboy. Uh, and as you say, it's the best essay in the book. So uh, good results as a result of that. Yeah. Chris, to go back to, to Cheryl's question um, one more time here about if Grant had led the, the Northern war effort from the very beginning, I mean, I think this does get to one of the important issues that we're, we're actually going to draw out in the second volume, which is what happens if the war ends um, before 1865? What happens if, say, the uh, Peninsula Campaign ends in the capture of Richmond in 1862? And, you know, we have to think about um, if, if the war ends with a a Union victory, some kind of brokered peace in the spring of 1862, slavery survives intact, right? Um, we have not yet reached anything approaching a consensus on emancipation. We have not uh, yet arrived at a preliminary emancipation proclamation at, um, at, at any sort of progress on, on removing the, the, the cancer of, of the rebellion. So I think that that's it's really important. I mean, sometimes things in history are, are significant because they happen, but oftentimes um, some of the most significant things in history didn't happen, right? Um, the war didn't end in the spring of 1862, or it didn't end prior to um, the enrollment and enlistment of black soldiers. Um, and so, so timing and periodization play a, an important role here uh, as well. And we're going to have an essay in the, the second volume um, of, of this collection that, that kind of wrestles with that, that thought. What happens if uh, the Union captures Richmond in the spring of 62? I'm fascinated by that idea of like what didn't happen. Um, Barton Meyer's essay where he talks about Lee not waging a guerrilla war uh, when he's you know, faced with being surrounded at Appomattox. Um, it's a fascinating question, you know, because certainly uh, Lee had people underneath him who were like, let's go to the mountains. Let's continue this. Let's carry this on. And, you know, Barton looks at that moment and, and you know, Lee's decision to not do that. And, and so history carries forward as we know that it did. Um, and, and we forget that that was a crucial moment and an important decision. And I love the way that he unpacks that and explores um, using some fantastic examples from Missouri, you know, and, and some other parallels that really illuminate that moment that, uh, that almost but didn't happen. Yeah. And reaching too into Lee's own biography, right? And thinking about um, the, uh, the struggles that that Lee had psychologically throughout his life with the figure of the shadow of his father, who, of course, um, you know, his role in the American Revolution is is tied up in guerrilla warfare and asymmetrical warfare, and and Barton kind of builds on 
that idea, the, the troubled relationship with the father and Lee's own experiences in Mexico to suggest that he had a real skepticism about um, irregular, irregular warfare. Now, Cheryl's asking another great question, uh, but, uh, but again, sort of someone acting out of character. What if Lincoln had been hands off and let the generals go on their own? And again, uh, and this goes back to, to, I think, the Grant question, too, in that everybody had a learning curve that they had to overcome. And I think that speaks to, you know, why does it take the North so long to win? Like, Lincoln's got to learn to be hands off. Grant's got to learn to be the general that he eventually becomes. Um, and, and you know, the federal army is saddled with a legacy structure with seniority that does not serve it well once the war happens. So like, everyone's got to work through all those sorts of things before kind of the combination rises to the top. Uh, so it's hard to sort of juxtapose those people into different parts of the war with different attitudes or acting in different ways because they have to, uh, as Brian said earlier, they have to evolve over the course of the war to get to the point where they can make the decisions or do the things that they do when they do them. And kind of, Chris, the, the, the flip side of, of Cheryl's question there about Lincoln, we, we do actually in some ways address this in, in the book with Cecily Zander's essay about Jefferson Davis's um, fidelity to Braxton Bragg, right? And in Bragg's career, I moved to Tennessee um, and it burnishes Grant's rising star at, at Chattanooga. And she wonders, you know, what happens if, if Davis, um, you know, does not become uh, such a reliable supporter of, of Bragg throughout the war? What happens if it goes in a different direction? And so, um, you know, there are places where we can play with these sorts of questions and where we do. And I, I think um, Cecily's essay in particular is, a, is an, an interesting one to, to think about, about how personalities and again, uh, individual biography can, can shape the, the flow of events. What I've kind of appreciated about the conversations we've been going on and, and like something will occur to us that will remind us about something one of our colleagues wrote in the collection and we're kind of pulling out all of these, these uh, great examples. Brian, uh, like I, I think we ended up with a great collection of historians writing about some fascinating stuff. Um, just tell me about your thoughts about that overall lineup. Um, you don't have to get into, you know, you don't have to check off everybody's name, but just tell me about the lineup in general. So, I mean, I think we have, one of the strengths of the collection is that we have historians who are really, really on the ground military historians, right, who uh, kind of have, have cut their teeth doing strategy and tactics, but we also have social and political historians, cultural historians who are, are coming at this from all different angles. Um, um, someone who is a, a diplomatic historian, and it again really shows the possibilities that can um, be opened up if you are alive to the war. Um, as, as something that's, that's human, as something that's fluid, as something that is contingent, right? And I think contingency is the, the key word that, that runs like a thread through all of, of these essays and, and cuts across all of these various subfields and, and ways of approaching the past. We uh, recover the past as something that did not have to happen the way that it turned out. And, and so we can study why it turns out the way that it does, but also appreciate right, that there um, is some complexity that our narratives uh, can, can ring out, right? There's a gap between historical events and their narration. And I think we, uh, these essays, these historians try to um, map that space and make that space a little bit more legible. And I really like the fact that, you know, because we have such a wide variety of colleagues that we, we called on coming from the public history sphere, the academic history sphere, um, uh, some some really great veterans like Tim Smith and yourself and, and some emerging voices like Cecily. Um, it really is like sitting around a table with a bunch of folks and just like, hey, let's talk about this. And all these different voices with all these different perspectives and all these different ideas. And uh, honestly, if, if someone reads this book and doesn't come away with some light bulb moments, I would be floored because, you know, 
as an editor reading this collection, there was light bulb moment after light bulb moment for me, particularly when then we start juxtaposing authors against each other. And well, they got me thinking about this and that made me think this way about this. Um, there's so much to think about with this collection uh, as you read the whole thing. Um, we're, we're actually coming up on time here. Um, I've skated away from most of these specific questions. I'm going to, uh, in order to just sort of stay true to my question about like, or to my promise that we'd get to some of these, I'm going to save the chat and I'm going to compile all of the what if questions that people have asked us. And I'm going to take a swing at them at the blog. I'll shoot them to Brian so he can see what we have. I'm the one who made the promise, so I'm not going to put him on the spot. Um, but if he wants to take a swing at him, he'd, he'd be more than welcome to. But uh, I'm going to try to take a swing at these for you guys just to, uh, to hold true to my word for you. Hey, uh, Chris, could you tell us uh, how our audience can purchase your book? So it's available from Savis Beatty, and uh, you can go to their website, SavisBeatty.com. Of course, you can find the book at Amazon, and a lot of bookstores are carrying it. The Military History Book Club chose it as a selection. Um, the History Book Club chose it as a selection. So those are places you can get it, too. But I think one thing that's really important, um, at least personally for me, is to encourage people to support independent publishing. Of course, we can go to Amazon and get these books. But if you go to Savis Beatty directly, not only can you get signed copies, but, you know, it's a small business and you can support a small business that's had a tough time as so many small businesses have in the publishing industry um, during during the pandemic um, supporting those uh, independent publishers allows you to get the sorts of books that you like because if those small businesses uh, those those small independent publishers disappear um, they're the ones who are really doing the heavy lifting when it comes to military history and uh, and producing the sorts of public history oriented civil war stuff that so many of you like I think that's exactly right. Uh, thank you so very much, Brian. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us tonight. I have one thing to say, and that's go Mariners. Good night, everyone. <laughs>